Welcome to a special edition of Kaleidoscope. This is Magda Zenon, recording from the buffer zone in downtown Nicosia. And with me in the studio, I have two cherished friends and awesome women, Sofia Papastavrou Faustman, who is the gender specialist advisor at World Vision and a member of the Mediterranean Woman Mediators Network, and Mine Atli, who's an active member of civil society, a lawyer, a practicing lawyer, and she's just been elected the first woman head of a party Tell me the party again, Minet. Social Democratic Party. So we have an excellent panel on board and a very special welcome all the way from Adelaide, Australia, to Ms. Stott Despoja. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure and quite an honour to join your panel today. Oh, I think the honour is ours. Um, let me introduce you to the audience that may not know you as well as we do, because you are a role model to so many women and you can give advice to so many women. You are still the youngest woman to enter the Australian Federal Parliament. You are a former leader of the Australian Democrats, so I think you'll be able to give me some guidelines. Um, you started at the beginning of 2021, the four-year term as an independent expert on the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. You're also Australia's ambassador for women and girls which involved 45 country visits between December 2013 and 2016 to promote women's economic empowerment, women's leadership, and to reduce violence in, uh, against women and girls, which is something that's really important. I don't know where to start, but where I will start so that we can open this conversation is you've had an illustrious career and it's gonna be it's just carrying on. Walk us through it. Walk us through the challenges and the good, the good parts and the bad parts, what's and all. Well, first of all, thank you for that introduction. Um, people in Australia and over the world still giggle now when I am introduced as the youngest ever woman to enter the federal parliament because it was a long time ago. So people often look at me now and say, my gosh, if she's the youngest, what's the average age of the Australian parliament? Uh, because it was 26 years ago. So obviously I'm a lot older now. But my journey is um, hard to encapsulate, but I suspect like... Uh, Many of your listeners, a combination of uh, wonderful opportunities, a bit of luck, a lot of hard work, and a lot of passion about a range of topics and policies and issues, but all underpinned by a strong commitment to gender equality. So i um, brought up by a single parent feisty feminist mother uh, who taught me that, you know, uh, girls can do anything boys can do and that it was really a, not only an obligation to have a career or be successful or achieve things, so to speak, it really mattered what you did for other people and particularly other women and girls. So all my roles have somehow involved the advancement of equality generally or gender equality specifically, whether it's as a former diplomat, a former senator, uh, yes, for a short time, a leader of a national political party, and we can delve into that, but congratulations. And now, uh, as someone passionate about the rights of women and girls in that multilateral context, um, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, but I'm a really new member of that uh, treaty body and uh, still learning the ropes or earning my stripes, as they say, but certainly... Um, yeah, my life has really revolved around how we can make the world a better place, a fairer place, a kinder place, and certainly particularly a place that is, I hope, less violent generally, but particularly sees the elimination of violence against women and children particularly. Thank you, Ms. Stottis. Mine, I think you have a good retort to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I see a lot of similarities. I, mean, um, I also was raised by a single mother of three. Uh, I lost my father when I was very young, and um, <clears throat> she too taught me the same. And um, actually, it was my own uh, domestic violence story that I encountered with my mother's husband that led me to uh, work with um, domestic violence, uh, to, to work on the issue of uh, domestic violence. And I think uh, during the 17 year struggle that I um, gave in civil society for women's rights, gender justice and uh, and eliminating violence against women. We still don't have um, um, a legislation for domestic violence in the northern part of Cyprus. So uh, something that we're, we're tackling. Um, we didn't have legal aid for survivors of domestic violence five years ago. Um, we now do through the lobbying and advocacy of my NGO. But <clears throat> I think that uh, the experience that I've gained through that those 17 years 
and looking at the root cause of domestic violence, which is power and control, is probably the most uh, valuable um, asset that I have now. Um, um, struggling in a political struggle for gender equality, uh, for for equality in um, in general, uh, because it's all it's all really about power and control, and it's always about um, um, uh, struggling for an equal power balance. Um, so, I mean, I've got plenty of questions that I want to ask, but I won't. I won't. Uh, I'll stop there. No, but ask her. This is what we have, Ms. Dot Despoja here. Ask her the questions. Let's have a conversation so that we can all learn. I'd like to know, um, in particular. How, I mean, because you had a background in uh, domestic violence and, and gender justice, um, what what tends to happen? I mean, what happens in Cyprus? What happens in Cyprus because it's such a small community as well, I guess. But I'm wondering if it happens on a larger scale. Is that people associate you directly with gender issues, and um, uh, somehow you're marginalised and and set out of the arena of talking about the quote real issues? Um, how were you able to break that? It's a really good point and questionable as to whether or not I've broken it, to be honest. I guess I came in as a relatively young politician, and you will understand this, uh, and subject to, particularly in the 90s, some of those ridiculous stereotypes and double standards to which I think women in all sectors, but particularly in public life, especially in politics, are subjected. So whether it was ridiculous comments about what I look like or whether I went into politics to meet a husband, I mean, yes, people actually ask those kind of ridiculous questions right through to perhaps the more serious and debilitating stuff, you know, whether it was death threats or harassment or all of those issues that we are at least talking about these days and exposing. And obviously different countries and different democracies and different parliaments have different levels of understanding, awareness, um, policies and practices to stamp those things out. And indeed, I think all of us are still trying to grapple with the culture that, that still exists that's very much in favour of a, you know, a patriarchal or a male-dominated um, you know, society. I think being taken seriously on a broad range of issues for me was always a challenge because I was a novelty, young mm -hmm female yes. so what did I know about the world what did I know about the issues even those about which I was passionate education or science or climate change you know these issues were very hard to be taken seriously on uh, especially those issues considered the domain of older people and men in particular you know <laughs> lots of white men in yes. suits in our time gray suits yep. over 60 <laughs> well there's no and, difference you know, here <laughs> Uh, well, and it's, I mean, this is it across the world. I mean, Australia, for all our extraordinarily, arguably paradoxical world-leading work, I mean, I belong to the state of South Australia, the first place in the world mm -hmm. to grant women not only the right to vote, but the right yep. to stand for parliament. And we've never had a female premier. So, you know, every country grapples with gender inequality because none have solved it of course absolutely but, you know I I feel heartbroken sometimes at the lack of progress in our parliament but mm -hmm. to your question you know my advice is of course you know it's trust your instinct you know what you're passionate about and what you're good at and women spend so much time proving you know we have to prove doubly especially in politics that we know our stuff and we're judged on seemingly superficial and meticulous bases compared to men you know they don't have to think about you know being ridiculed on the basis of what they wear or you know judged for their suitability for politics on the basis of their marital status or how many kids they've got you know so we're overcoming these issues so often mm -hmm. but the thing that got me through regardless of all these peripheral issues was knowing and having some kind of almost naive confidence that I had an equal right to be reflected and represented in that place as any man, an older man that happened to be in there. And now what I wish for is that, you know, that we're reflected and represented in all our diversity and difference. And that's taking a long time here, as I'm sure it's taking a long time there. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I was just thinking about, um, sort of the the dynamics here on the island uh, we're living on a divided island and um 
women in politics, we talk about women's participation in politics um, and when the, the few women in parliament may not necessarily be feminist. Um, and not only that, they may not wish or want or work for or fight for a solution to the Cyprus issue. So I was just wondering how that that dynamic of working in a post, you know, post-conflict country um, like this island um, around, how do you work around that, especially um, in your line of, in your work and your expertise in meeting so many women in politics, how do you grapple with the fact that you perhaps will run into women that perhaps are not or aligned with feminist um, feminist approaches or methodologies? Isn't this one of the toughest, most interesting areas? Because yeah. <laughs> um, I guess in an historical sense, you know, when I first walked into parliament, I had, you know, I've been brought up in the women's movement. And of course, we're not without divisions. But I had such faith in sisterhood that that's what I expected that I would encounter when I got into parliament. I thought the few women that were in there, 14% of the parliament was female. I thought we'll have a natural bond. We may not always agree, but, you know, of course we're not homogeneous, but I always thought the things we had in common would definitely stand us in better stead than dealing with our divisions. And I've never expected women to have some kind of ameliorating force on parliaments. You know, I'm not that kind of biological determinist that we're going to be better because we're nicer or kinder all the time. Of course we're, you know, it, we just have every right to have our differences represented in the same way that men would expect nothing less. But yes, one of the great challenges of my political life was the differences with uh, female colleagues around issues that I consider absolutely pivotal. So sexual and reproductive health rights, for example. For sure. So, you know, those issues I, you know, on the flip side though, when women worked together on those issues, we could overcome so much, whether it was in my country, the issue of, you know, access to um, uh, abortion drugs, whether it was the issue of stopping the, the, you know, what we always know is the backlash on uh, rights of termination, whether it was access to sexual and reproductive health care or knowledge, including in our uh, international development work, um, whether it was the right to have access to pregnancy counselling that wasn't biased uh, or uninformed, we're still trying to tackle that one. But they're the areas where I expected women to work together and it didn't always happen. You know, you ask a really, you know, poignant but also important question about in post-conflict environments. And, you know, I can't give you better knowledge or advice from, you know, people who have lived experience. You understand that you would hope that the desire for change and progress mm -hmm. and unity and, you know, obviously yeah, furthering of the rights of women and children, that right. that, would, that would be enough. But, of course, it's not. It's much more complex. And going back, Mina, to your point about power, what do we know about power? It's hard to get. It's um, very rare that people relinquish it. Men don't like giving up power. And so once you get into that, you know, the powerful tend to side with the powerful in order to survive. And so often the powerless do too. Why? Women, we've been taught, you know, don't rock the boat, don't, you know, upset the system. And so often the path of access to power for women has been working for or with men. Mm -hmm. And so for us to develop our own unique networks especially in politics is really really hard and I hated it when women were pitted against each other or played off against each other partly because there are so few of us in that context or in that place at any given time but yes mm -hmm. my great desire is to see women support each other whether that's in any profession or any environment and certainly when it comes to younger women I get very concerned when I see reports that young women including in Australia mm -hmm. believe that men still should have you know, a dominant role in decision-making in relationships, um, even though they support men and women, boys and girls, or mm -hmm. non-binary people, right. however we relate, they should be equal in everything. What is it about men's having a dominant role in decision-making mm -hmm. in relationships? Breaks my heart. Absolutely. 
it's also a very difficult um, one for women, female feminist politicians, I think, because mm -hmm. uh, in my uh, speech um, for when I was uh, going to be elected as the, the president of the party, uh, I one of the things that I mentioned was, um, you know, the fact that it was unfair for trans women who weren't operated to be able to carry their own, to choose their identity. And mm -hmm. this is something that I've been saying for 17 years and mm -hmm. I've had no black backlash. And all these people that, that I've um, been saying this to you, the, the audience was pretty much the same, really. But when it came to, to saying it as a party leader, I got a lot of backlash because then all of a sudden it was like, uh, you know, maybe you shouldn't have mentioned that then because uh, it's not it's a peripheral issue. It's not you know, it's not really the key issue. You, you kind of you dragged it out of it by talking about this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's a really difficult one to deal with. I have a personal question that I'd like to ask. Absolutely. Okay. Something I'm very curious about, uh, Miss uh, Scott Despoia. Um, I, I did a Google search on you, of course, before we did the podcast. And um, I read that you um, took a break from po politics um, to have a family. And I just um, empathized uh, what that would be like. I mean, um, I have a six-year-old son. Um, I'm divorced and I'm, I'm now engaged. Um, and if, if I were to, to, to get pregnant now and say, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I need to take a break for my child and for my family for six months, mm -hmm. I cannot imagine the backlash that I would get from both sides. Uh, because on the one hand, it would be, um, well, look, see, even she's taking a break from, uh, from politics. And on the mm -hmm. other side, um, that it would be, well, you know, obviously you can see that, um, you know, she's a good, she's a good mum, but, but, you know, that, that, that comes first, being a mother comes first, as Mina has demonstrated. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you deal with that, with that dilemma? And, and can you talk to us about the processes that you went through that? You're basically telling me the script of my life. Sorry, sorry. I actually think it's something that a lot of women in power faced, what yeah. you say. Yeah. Look, I, and you, you're exactly right. That was precisely the narrative 14 years ago when I left the Australian Senate. Um, you know, I, I just often describe it as a bit of an empowering decision in the sense that, you know, when you're a third party senator or, you know, someone from a minor party and you've done 13 years in the parliament, um, you know, it's sort of, I'm not sure what the equivalent is in dog years, but, you know, it's sort of like <laughs> compared to my, you know, the party colleagues from the major parties who didn't quite have the same workloads and didn't have quite the same pressures. So, I'd had a very long stretch. In fact, at that stage was the longest serving member of my party ever. Uh, wow. So I wanted the opportunity to spend time with my, you know, growing or relatively young family. And I didn't want to be, you know, particularly doing the travel, not so much the workload, it was the travel. At that stage, Parliament House in Canberra didn't have childcare facilities. And I often, right. you know, say to people that, the first time I visited the childcare centre after I left uh, the federal parliament, I did have a bit of a cry because sure. I, it, it could have changed my life. But more importantly, I thought of the women around my time or beforehand who might have had different political careers. So mine was a little career interrupted, but it was also me sending a message about choice. And I was a privileged woman with power who made a choice. However, you're right, the interpretations were exactly as bipolar as you describe you know, I remember, you know, they did this wonderful piece about me when I returned to Parliament with my son when he was born three months after when he was when he was three months. And they did this glorious photo for International Women's Day or whatever it was. And the backlash was immediate. I got women saying if she really cared about her son, she would have quit altogether. Others saying she should have taken longer. And then there were others who did, oh, you know, I'd love tax payer funded maternity leave for three months. Not that I had that, but still, you know, so we, we love interfering in motherhood, don't we? You know, so for me, the bottom line has always been choice. So that's something when I was leader of the party, long before I got married or had kids or any of that, but I was proud to introduce Australia's first paid parental leave legislation, for example. Um, you know, during my time in the Senate, again, before my kids were even a twinkle in, you know, my eye, um, I introduced changes to the Senate standing orders so that women could breastfeed because we'd had a situation where a woman had been thrown out of the parliament because she'd been tenderly breastfeeding her child because she had to be in the parliamentary chamber. So, you know, the advice is we've got to be kinder to each other. Why do we critique women's choices 
and options like we don't with men ever. Not, I can't remember anyone questioning a man's decision to either return to parliament after having a child or giving up parliament for family reasons. It's a complete double standard. It still exists to this day. And the best we can do mm -hmm. is basically be the role models that we want to be for any choice, whether it's Jacinda Ardern, whose partner stays at home, or whether it's women who decide, you know what, this is what I want to do. I want to spend time with my kids. And the best thing we can do for women who don't have the same, arguably, the same mm -hmm. power and privilege and right. choices that we have is to be those role models who implement the legislation and the policies and the practices and the cultures mm -hmm. that actually make it better for the next generation. But, yeah, oh, yeah, I, I was... Yeah. Some women were disappointed, so disappointed in me and it broke my heart. And there were others who were probably very happy to see me go. <laughs> wow. Can I use my privilege as the facilitator? Can you, so is, has there been progress in terms of gender equality within Australia since you've been around? How has it improved? Has it improved? It sounds like it's improved slightly, but have you seen an essential improvement? It's a really great question because, you know, Australia did some extraordinary things, including, you know, pioneering legislation for women's rights, whether it's sex discrimination law, equal pay legislation, even the Married Women's Property Act, you know, more than 100 years ago, I think now. Um, but, you know, 1902, women, with the exception of women, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, had the right to vote in Commonwealth parliaments. So we did a lot of things early. But the rate and the pace of change has been slow, really slow. Right. Uh, and I think there's a complacency in our for country. Sure. So, for example, we're 50th now in the world mm -hmm. when it comes to women's representation in parliaments. Um, we still have a gender pay gap of at least 14% for a country that pioneered equal pay. That's pretty bad. We've still got only around 5% of uh, CEOs of the 200 ASX listed companies are women um, and we're worse on issues when it relates to diversity generally. Um, around 30 odd percent of our parliament is female. That's pretty bad considering the time we've had to make progress. Violence against women, well as you all know across the world we're looking at um, you know at least a third of women experiencing uh, some form, and I, you know, and I know the good work that you've done, uh, Mina, in, in in this particular space, not only um, nationally, but you know, and I, I know that you've you've changed lives, you've literally saved lives, and I know that you'll continue to do that from this extraordinary leadership position. But in Australia, you know, on average, every week a woman is killed, yep. uh, and people are often shocked by those statistics in a country like Australia. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, we still have relatively high rates of domestic violence, family violence, and sexual assault. Right. Sophia. Wow. Um, I just wanted to, actually, if you don't mind, I wanted to circle back to motherhood because I wanted to sort of flag that motherhood on the island, uh, on both sides of the island, um, represents a very specific kind of woman. Um, and it is part of a militarized project. It's part of the way um, women are perceived as, as peace builders. We're perceived as women that are the motherhood piece or, or narrative is that we are raising the next generation, um, but in a very specific way, um, again, towards the, the, uh, the, the militarized piece, that highly hyper-masculine piece um, that we've seen um, that really roots patriarchy and misogyny on the island with the mix of that, again, that militaristic um, tendency so that, um, motherhood has a different type of meaning in the way that we're raising our children specifically our in, in our boys to be men to fight to protect our women and girls so i just i'm, I'm using quotes but um i think that's something that at least mine and and megda and, and and myself and others in our work have tried to unpack and that's where i think um the exacerbation of gender-based violence sort of also is rooted in all of that sort of um, is percolating through that. But I wanted to just ask, um, you know, we've seen that women and girls have faced an increased threats of GBV during the pandemic. And of course, conflict and post-conflict recovery, we've seen the disruption of very crucial sexual and reproductive health services, especially um, when health care and resources are stretched during the pandemic. Um, 
And we know, of course, that violence against women occurs during peacetime and in times of crisis and conflict, and it's preventable. So what do we need to do, and I quote you, to create a new normal? Well, you know, the three of you with your work, expert work in human rights, and Mina, your, you know, particular extraordinary commitment to you know, supporting survivors and the issue of prevention, you all know that while we can say there's no single, you know, factor oh, that explains gendered violence. Have I frozen? No, oh, no, I was no, going no. to say that um, while we know there's no single factor that explains violence against women and children, the evidence base is now pretty clear, isn't it? And we know right. that there are drivers um, that result in increased levels of this violence, including you know, limits on women's freedom and rigid gender stereotypes, which goes to your point, yeah. of course, about you know, the designated or perceived roles of women, uh, particularly in relation to motherhood and yes, raising the next generation. And, but don't you always find that in conflict situations, you know, we grapple with the increased expectations on women to, um, you know, there are times when women have additional roles, almost masculine okay. roles, whether For it's sure. in a military sense or whether it's keeping the home fires burning or whether it's creating, you know, keeping the economy going. And, of course, traditionally after that, any kind of additional rights or empowerment that women have is qu quickly stripped away. But there's still that underlying notion of our traditional roles as, as mothers and, and caregivers and with it, uh, the notion that these are somehow, even when we're being put on pedestals for perform performing those roles, there's still an underlying sense that that is inferior to what uh, to men bring to the table. So when you ask about the new normal, of course, we've got to tackle those attitudes and behaviours that give rise to this violence. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, limits on women's independence or male peer relationships that emphasise aggression or any attitudes that, you know, condone disrespect of women but again I get back to rigid gender stereotypes and so to get to a new normal well education absolutely critical um, but we always think in terms of in the work that I've done with our watch the National Foundation to prevent violence against women and their children in Australia is you know we're going to tackle the settings you know those oh. settings where we live love learn work and play so it's not enough for me to oh, teach for my sure. kids that violence is wrong I need the sporting coach to do the same thing and I need Absolutely. early and appropriate you know respectful relationships education in schools and I need the media not to you know bring out ridiculous stereotypes and I need children to be able to look at our parliaments and say wow men women non-binary Australians oh, sure. anyone can sure. be a leader so you know I know that you all know the answers but it's um because we, we work in this area but um you know, if there's just one person out there who thinks, oh, I could actually, you know, influence my children's perception of this or help eliminate violence, particularly mm -hmm. gendered violence by little things, sharing the chores, you know, seeing women reflected in positions of power, paying women equally, all of these things, we can all do something, no matter how small, to change the story that actually results in violence against women and children. How have you navigated that toxic masculinity in parliament and in government? Because I, I, we, we were very privy to watch your document, the documentary that you were featured in and, and other women colleagues in politics in Australia. And I'm just wondering, I mean, some of those uh, scenes were really, I mean, the toxicity, the mascu toxic, toxic, excuse me, masculinity was so incredibly intense. How did you navigate that? I'm so pleased you've got to see that. It's wonderful journalist Annabelle it's Kraut awesome. from our, um, yeah, Australian Broadcasting Corporation who just, you know what, even looking back at those scenes, it was really almost, well, triggering, sure. but also so many things that I'd forgotten about or chosen to suppress because I'd forgotten how difficult in the 90s, it was very difficult. And yet some of the scenes, the most powerful scenes that you would have seen are actually modern, you know, reflections on parliamentary behaviour. Wow. So, you know, you even look back over decades to what women were subjected. Navigating it, well, you know, there are different ways that we navigate things, aren't there? I mean, there are times when you can't call out bad behaviour because it's made worse for you. 
Mm-hmm. And I used to, you know, stand up and take great pride in calling out inappropriate or sexist behaviour. And for that, usually I was ridiculed or, you know, told that I couldn't take the heat or you get a nickname like, you know, Princess Precious or whatever. What I love about Australia's younger generation, particularly Mm -hmm. of female leaders, is they are calling out this behaviour. They just won't put up with it. Um, So sometimes, yep, you go with the flow. Sometimes you call it out. Sometimes you get absolutely destroyed in the process. And I still think we're learning to navigate. Um, I've learned a lot watching the younger generation, how they just have no time for it. I'm constantly feeling inspired by what's going to happen next because I think that the next generation won't put up with some of the ridiculous and offensive things that some of us did put up with. But if you've got any tips for navigating toxic masculinity, <laughs> masculinity anywhere, I'll take it. <laughs> navigating through it. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, start with a, uh, I'm going to give a tip but uh, with a self, huge self-critique, actually. And I'm going to go back to the motherhood thing because I Sounds really good. want to share this on this podcast. For sure. So when I, when I had uh, my son, uh, I was breastfeeding. And to me, that was my passport to being able to do everything else that I did. So I would be able to be involved in politics, in the women's movement, and keep going to hearings, uh, be, a, be a lawyer and... Uh, but as long as I kept breastfeeding, the moment that I stopped breastfeeding, I felt, and, and I criticized myself, and I put so much pressure on myself. You know, there were, there were people who worked um, maybe one fifth of the hours that I did uh, that were breastfeeding a little bit and had mm-hmm. some substitute meal, milk. But for me, mm-hmm. that was never an option. I did not give myself that choice. And when we talk about choice, we really need to realize how much we uh, destroy ourselves in the mm. process. And how much pressure we exert on ourselves because i remember being in a hearing and i had a breast milk um on my underwear that's i mean not my bra my, literally my underwear because my because there was so much milk and um i didn't ask for an adjournment because um i i thought you know if i do then people will reflect on me and say you know she, she can't do both Wow. And I remember having to go abroad for, for work for three days, four days. And mm-hmm. I would have, I would spend the, the week beforehand expressing milk, putting it into the freezer, uh, going into the conference, coming out, going to the toilet, expressing my milk into the toilet. You know, exp- all, all of these things, because um, I felt that that was my passport. I could the only way that I could say that I'm a good mother mm-hmm. and doing all of these other things is if I keep breastfeeding. So yeah. I really want the one advice that I would be able to give back to myself pre-birth would be to just give yourself a break. And, yeah. it's, and it's OK for to, sure to be able to, to be kind to, to yourself, to use modern technology. Yeah. And it's part of that invisible labor, isn't and, it? And it? And it is your choice and you don't have to prove anything. So that's so mm. I'll start can I that. just can I just interrupt? That's yeah. what Ms. Uh, Starter Sapoya said earlier. You've got to be kinder to yourself. Yes. You've got mm-hmm. to be kinder to yourself and to each other. And this is one specific instance that you should have been kind. But I think we don't talk about that invisible labor and the fact that you're sharing this on the podcast as, you know, as a woman in politics, as a leader um, in your in the community um, is is instrumental in, in, in breaking some of the taboos and stereotypes and stigma of of mothering and being in politics and being a leader and, you know, being a woman. And I think that's, that's really, I think in many ways, courageous. I think on the island, we hold on and we're, you know, we're sort of stuck on those harmful gender stereotypes if we don't discuss these issues. You know, we cover up when we're breastfeeding in public, we go to the toilet um, and breastfeed our child, which is something I refused to do when I was breastfeeding my daughter. So um, I, you know, I commend you for that. And another thing, is that um, despite all of the literature that we read and all the workshops that we attend and all the training that we attend, being a mother for me was um, a huge amount of training. For example, yes. mm. people for were, sure. on, on, on breaking gender stereotypes. So people would approach me, my son, who at the time was two years, he's six years old now, he was two years old, and they would say to him, oh, it, smiling with a huge beam on their face, <laughs> saying, oh my God, aren't you going to break hearts with a great big smile on their faces? So <laughs> 
there I was able to analyze, you know, the confusion that a, a child would would feel at that point because that she, there he is with a mother that tells him that you have no right to break somebody's heart mm-hmm. and you have no right to harm somebody, to damage somebody, to hurt somebody. And then yeah. other people expressing that to them with, with these huge smiles as though it's something that's completely endorsed, completely justified yeah. and encouraged, in fact. Mm-hmm. So to be aware of all, to, to, to be able to go through that process as a mother, as a mother for sure um, is is a great asset i think um as long as uh, we give ourselves a break as mothers and mm-hmm. as women that are in politics as well striving for change but there's such powerful stories and um you know your your latter point about the way that we you know we create those stereotypes so early you know with children and with young people whether it's the binary of colors, you know, girls wear pink and boys wear blue. I mean, we still do that. We have gendered toys. We, you know, these may seem simplistic, but it actually is part of that continuum that leads to, you know, inequality and equality that leads to disrespect. And disrespect doesn't always result in violence, but it's certainly the precursor. And when you talk about, I mean, I the breastfeeding stories, you know, you've made me think, I remember. Similarly, I did my first trip, um, Senate committee trip with my son still breastfeeding. And I remember having to sit in a taxi outside the committee venue because that was the only way that I could, uh, you know, perform my motherly duties, so to speak, um, without interrupting the committee. And I remember too, when they heard that I was bringing my son, because I said, I'm not going to leave him at home, I'm breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. Um, and the clerk of the parliament rang my office and asked my staff for a copy of my breastfeeding schedule. And I just thought, it doesn't happen that way. It really doesn't. <laughs> but it showed, you know, it's comical now almost. But at the time, I realised that just the idea, there was no understanding, the lack of comprehension of the role of women in politics, diversity in politics, uh, let alone um, you know, women who were were mothers. So, you know, those stories, oh, I feel you, sister, I really do. Um, <laughs> it was, no, they were tough times. And you know what? I probably put a similar pressure on mm-hmm. myself, but also there was an added um, utility in breastfeeding because, yep, it was the easiest way that I could keep moving, go back to parliament, perform my roles. Mm. And it, there's a, as you know, when I finally went to see my paediatrician, it chokes me up even think about it now, at the six-month mark, you know, when you go back and you say, guess what, I've just breastfed, you know, haven't done anything else. And I'm so proud of myself because I said, you know, I've juggled everything yep. and I've done the six-month exclusively. And the paediatrician said to me, you professional women, you always lie as if you've managed to be a senator and do six months breastfeed exclusively. Whoa. And instead of being my normal strident feminist self, I wanted to cry. And my husband was with me at the time, who I think mm-hmm. was in shock, first of all, that anyone would say that to me. And he actually said, no, no, she's done it. She's done it. But isn't it extraordinary? Not only the pressure we put on ourselves, and it's not like I was expecting an elephant stamp. I just thought, He's calling me a liar when I've done exactly what I'm supposed to do, you know, according to the book. So, yes, women, we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. (laughs) You're you're lucky to have a husband that said that because I I had no recognition of that. And and, and really, I mean, to be a woman in politics and struggling and fighting for women's rights and um, talking about violence and violence against women and the psychological aspect of it, Mm-hmm. and then uh to, to have uh, you want that recognition and you want that endorsement and you want that appreciation and you want somebody to say well done and the person you want it from the most is the person closest to you your child's father and to to not have that um i mean you can imagine i mean the important role that your husband played at that point yeah. and and for, for all of those women out there that don't have that 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 do have this uh, that would have a husband that would turn her over to the mm-hmm. pediatrician and and nod perhaps or look at you in in more you know in a more weary oh did you trick me did you give you know so so that it it also with the experience of being a mother the experience of also um being in a relationship where you do rely on that appreciation and that uh, um, 
that pat on the back, it makes you realize the extent of the um, the the pain that women go through when when that that isn't in their lives. Um, so yes, thank yeah. you for that. I'm dying. To it's ask it's, it's, it's such a turn, so go for it. Go for it. Why don't we just do oh, that? There's no your turn. And there's no turn. I'm worried that we're going to run out of time. Yeah. Time to ask Ms. Oh, uh, Scott to jump in. One question. I, I thought we were going for a few hours, so I'm good. <laughs> Love it. Uh, do good. you have we're a few hours? Time. Because we have. <laughs> this is Dr. Spoyer. Um, so our struggle is a very difficult one. Okay, the, the struggle for justice, so the, the struggle for peace, the struggle for people to appreciate one another and respect one another is, a very, is an ongoing one. And we know that we can uh, struggle for something for years and years, and then in one night it's taken from under our feet. Um, do you, have you ever in your in your political career in your struggle for either gender justice or justice on on a whole have you ever felt like you're you're trying you're leading um a battle that cannot be won and and what is the tip that you would give to us when when you get that way when you feel that what is it that keeps you going and makes you wake up the next day and say right i'm still going to pursue changing the world oh gosh you know, we've probably got similar responses to this. The fact that we've got no choice, exactly. the yeah. fact that we have reaction. to create change and try and, you know, whether it's with legislation or policies um, or even, you know, in the area that I've worked in the last eight years, cultural change, mm -hmm. um, we have to try and change lives for the better. Um, when we're talking about violence against women and children, which is such a scourge, then we're literally talking about saving lives, something that you've all been involved in. Um, do I feel disheartened at times? Absolutely. I'm, I, I must admit these days, and I'm not frontline, but I'm, I'm quite haunted by the pervasiveness of women suffering um, yeah. in my own country. But then again, I look around the world. I look at my region, you know, which has some of the highest rates of violence against mm -hmm. women in the world, some of the lowest levels of representation. Um, through the CEDAW work now, I am actually, even in my first year and a bit, overwhelmed by some of the similar stories, but of course, you know, some are compounded depending on what kind of country or what the issues are, you know, the intersectional issues of discrimination, disadvantage, and sometimes I think, are we ever going to solve this? Um, I suspect, like all of you, sometimes I feel it's two steps forward and a step back. And Sophia, you, you know, you mentioned COVID, you know, and it's absolutely disproportionate impact on women and girls, uh, including as frontline carers or workers or informal workers, uh, the exacerbation of women's inequalities in the home, in the workplace. Then, of course, as you mentioned, the absolute escalation of violence against women and children around the world, you know, in different ways, whether it's coercive control, physical violence, whether it's cyber violence, which, of course, the online violence in Australia on, you know, the Easter weekend alone in 2020 increased by 600%. So these issues worry me, you know, more women and girls now subject to FGM as yep. a consequence. Uh, another 10 million more girls will be potentially early forced marriage yep. victims. Um, and school education, which we all know is the equaliser, the great equaliser, 1.6 billion children will be out of school as a consequence of this pandemic. So that's not to give you all the bad stuff, sorry. Am I occasionally disheartened? Yes. But then I look at progress and we do make progress. The fact that we're talking about breastfeeding in Parliament or the fact that we're sharing our stories, the fact that we know that there is another generation, you know, and that's to recognise, of course, I, you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants, you know, the, the, the women and the feminists that have come before me and the women's movement in my country and across the world, that gives me hope. And then the next thing that gives me hope is that we're all learning including women like me with my privilege, learning that there's no point in doing this unless it's intersectional and yep. that it involves everyone. Exactly. So our responsibilities as women in a movement, mm -hmm. be it equality generally or gender equality particularly, 
all of this stuff we're learning we're talking about and we're doing better even though sometimes it feels like the pace of change is snail-like but why do we do it all the same reason I suspect I feel like we've got no choice you can't sit on the sidelines and my role has been about trying to make it better for the next generation whether that's a greener fairer planet or whether it's mm-hmm. particularly that issue of achieving a violence-free community, country, region, world. I just wish more people would um, would join us. Um, wow, I'm, <laughs> there's so much there uh, to unpack. I just wanted to circle back to the pandemic. Just um, to bear in mind that we've got about five or 10 minutes. Oh, okay, so I'm gonna Sorry. make this really super quick. <laughs> so. Of course, since the pandemic began, of course, we've seen the exacerbation of GBV um, and of course, schools closed during lockdowns. Um, This has, of course, increased the share of unpaid care work and labor, despite the fact that we've seen men, um, though not predominantly primary caregivers, sharing some of the workload. And in Cyprus, um, my work with the World Bank, we found that um, keeping women in the labor force and ensuring that they stay employed was actually a challenge, particularly women living in rural areas. And I was wondering in your experience, how do you suggest supporting that, prime, first of all, primary caregivers? How do we start unpacking and addressing unpaid care work and invisible labor and the mental load? Um, of course, now exacerbated by the pandemic. And how do we keep women employed? I know for myself, I purposefully work from home remotely um, for World Vision Canada. Um, yesterday, my daughter was unwell and she was you know, sitting behind me while I was having a, a full-on you know, conference on the Ukraine, uh, Ukraine humanitarian response. And my daughter is asking to hear a podcast on, you know, a children's podcast. So she's doing that while I'm one with my team for the Ukraine response. And I just thought there's so much invisible labor going on with, especially with my male comrades, uh, colleagues, excuse me. And I just thought, is this for real? How do we support? It can't just be me because I'm in a position of incredible privilege, right? And I just thought it can't be me. What about, how do we support those primary, you know, women as primary caregivers? Oh, look, these are such good questions. And, you know, your World Bank work, you would know some of the answers, but we also know that it's not just about the policies, the practices, even the resources. It's about goodwill and political will. Mm -hmm. And that is so often missing. You know, I would think in a country like Australia, a developed nation, relatively fortunate, has been very fortunate relatively through the pandemic. It's not to make light of, you know, fatalities and the the differences that it's made to people's lives, particularly women. But, you know, why are we not using this opportunity to reimagine our society, to suddenly go, you know what, who were the frontline workers in this pandemic? Oh, my gosh. Who are the people that we needed the most? We needed the cleaners, the educators, the informal workers. Women were the majority of our healthcare workers. But not only that, of course, as you refer, most women were dealing with the low-skilled, arguably low-paid work, including, yes, juggling online learning. And we became teachers as well as doing all the other things that we did. So childcare workers, I mean, why wouldn't governments turn around and say, you know what, we got this wrong. Why don't we start rewarding those feminized industries? Why don't we start giving incentives for women to not only enter but be maintained in the workplace? Why don't we do something about the casualization of jobs, something that impacts women in particular and, of course, has consequences right through in terms of education, income, you know, employment opportunities in the future, their superannuation, they retire with less, etc. So I, when you ask for the answers, it's not like we don't know them. We, we so do true. know the answers, so but true. again, it gets back to power, doesn't it? So we know, and we all know the stats and the research that show more women in positions of leadership ultimately lead to, you know, better distribution of resources, better maintenance of public infrastructure. Uh, indeed, you know, the likelihood that a country will use military intervention to resolve international disputes is affected by the number of women in a parliament, you know, The number of women in a parliament or in leadership roles influences the aspirations and the attainment of education for girls, particularly in developing countries. So we know power matters. So I know that there's all these interlinked issues. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to work on economic empowerment and we've got to eliminate violence. But I'm a great believer in my former profession 
because I want more women to be ruling their countries. And that is not or equivalent. You know, I want gender parity in our decision making institutions. And that's not because I don't understand change can happen elsewhere because I loved being an activist and I love working through other channels. But I desperately want to see more women, more diverse women in our parliamentary institutions running the countries. I really feel powerful about that. I really feel strongly about it. I mean, are you scribbling away there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Miss uh, Stockness Boy just wrote my next speech for me. <laughs> no. I feel very old every time you refer to me as Miss Stock Despoir. I feel like, you know, but it's Natasha. Most people can't pronounce Stock Despoir um, in, uh, in my neck of the woods. So they're always like, oh, it's Natasha. So much easier. Can I interrupt? Uh, is there perhaps anything you want to ask our, uh, Sophia and Mine? Do you want, should we turn the tables for five minutes? Is there anything? Would Absolutely. <laughs> I want to know, Mine, how you are finding your role I mean you are a, a, a role model I mean it's a, a heroic and challenging and terrifying position to be in but it's it's extraordinary isn't it and you know awesome. what are your plans <laughs> what are your challenges my my biggest uh, the biggest criticism that came to me um and Natasha was uh when I was uh, elected I gave an interview to the public broadcasting agency and I said if my party hadn't, because my party for the first time in 46 years um, uh, could not pass the threshold this election and the president quit and that's when there was uh, an opening and I ran as a candidate and when I gave the interview I said if my party had passed the threshold, our threshold is 5%. Mm -hmm. And I said, if my party had passed the threshold by 0.1%, so if we had got 5.01% of the votes, there is no way a woman would have been able to be the president of the party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got so much criticism for it, but it was so much the truth. And now I, I have to be weary of the fact that there's a lot of um, kind of uh, face value kind of, we support you that's great um it's brilliant that women are involved in politics but mm -hmm. then then you can see in their eyes that they're wary uh, and I, I i'm seeing tendencies in the party that i've never seen before for example people um are telling me as a party leader to calm down <laughs> don't be emotional <laughs> to, to calm down and, and to slow down i mean the, the years that the party leader has been criticized for for but not speaking up enough and, wow. and not being active enough and, and not responding fast enough. And now all of a sudden the party leader is being criticised. Yeah, and she is. being told to calm down, to be slower, to be more rational. Is this by men and women? Yes, it's by men and by women. By men and women. Um, Interesting. I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of hearing this word rational. You have to be rational. And, I mean, and you know, it's um, because I grew up in the party. I was actually 17 years old when I first uh, took a step into the party. So I know... Uh, the party dynamics very well. I've been a member of the uh, committee, the, the mm -hmm. main um, the executive, uh, the executive for, for, for many years. So I know what the, the cultures are. And um, th there has never been, for example, a culture of uh, getting everything um, voted by the central committee, uh, by this executive. Um, all of a sudden, though, there's this big need for it. Uh, they they need to have the safety nets <laughs> to make sure that this uh, this woman is not doesn't going take to, over to lead the the party into some kind of a revolution. Fingers for crossed. sure. But, <laughs> but um, it's so it's very tough. It's it's obviously you know for all of the personal reasons. Um, I, I'm one thing I would say to to women that are involved in politics is be very wary of um, the pressures that we face um, through of through gender roles whilst we are trying to break them and also be very wary of the men mm -hmm. who say things like you're there because I supported you or you know how much I supported you right wow <laughs> yeah payback time yeah it's <laughs> surreal it's oh I relate to that um on so so many levels but uh, a fifth of Australians believe that men make better politicians mm -hmm. because they're less emotional and more rational and if you ever get a chance to look at the current state of the Australian Parliament, you will disagree with that vehemently, believe me. Having said that, I also want men to feel that they can be emotional. I want us all to be multifaceted and not, you know, constrained by these, you know, rigid, you know, gender stereotypes. But I'm curious from all of you, given your human rights work and understanding of equality and advocacy, is there any advice or any requests that you have of me as a CEDAW member? 
um, you know, I know particularly, you know, the work and Sophia, your work on, you know, women, peace and security, for example. I mean, how do you see some of our multilateral institutions mm -hmm. serving women and girls around the world, not only in the context of a pandemic, but in the context of conflict and post-conflict environments? What could we be doing better? For sure. I mean, I'm going to speak um, on behalf of the FIAP, the Feminist International Assistance Policy from Canada, um, that we really need to focus on that localization piece. I think it's been really interesting for me as a Canadian Cypriot living living on the island, working remotely for a Canadian international development organization, um, is that we have uh, organizations and uh, you know, CETA representatives or women, peace and security networks coming and other key donors like the Nordic countries coming to, to the island, also Australia and Canada as well, um, coming in sort of parachuting in, um, doing sort of a rough assessment or analysis. And I feel like we are expecting women's rights organizations, the grassroots movements, the LGBTQI communities um, to sort of do the work. Um, and I think what we need to do is really look at um, and do the work um, in terms of sort of on a voluntary basis. And I think on one hand, we need to look at how those funding streams are, um, looking at those funding streams, looking at how we can utilize those local, local voices and looking at um, these groups as agents of change, as opposed to parachuting in and saying, this is our mandate for Canada, this is what it looks like, or Australia, and this is, we're gonna be putting that on you. And I think we sort of skip, and I see this not just for Cyprus, but across the board in other, in other country portfolios, like of course, Afghanistan or DRC or Somalia or Ethiopia and others, um, Lebanon, um, that localization piece, and, in, and this is part of our FIAP, uh, for Canada is how do you how do you look at again in centralizing women and girls as key agents participating and engaging them um, in the design of projects and implementation monitoring and evaluation and really putting them at the center and I think that piece has been sort of like we get so much from the outside and I feel like at, on one hand at least I can speak for the island is um, of what I've observed is okay, so what part of that is truly local and Cypriot? Um, because there's so much wealth in our, in our traumas, in our intergenerational trauma, in of our experience of conflict, um, and part of those pieces that, you know, that, that lived experience on, um, that are the nuances of the island that I think from the outside in um, can be tricky. Um, so I think that's one piece. I think really also unpacking those, um, those powers, you mentioned power, power is central to all of this. And I think in order to do that, we need to look at more of a gender transformative approach in the way we, the way we respond to power. And I think those are some of the things I would start at the very beginning <laughs> to look at. I know she we don't send a list if you want. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be sent a list. Um, I'm also happy to be parachuted in to meet you all for dinner and have a chat about this. Um, but it is, uh, it's it's really interesting to join a treaty body at this time and and also be relatively new and arguably a little naive on um, some of the the personal dynamics that exist you know there's a that you've got to work through um, the geopolitics and so many things as a new as a new member um, I, I, one thing I do acknowledge with my country is that uh, the foreign minister who was uh, put my name forward for CEDAW is from a different political party from me so you know there was an uh, you know and and so that doesn't always happen and so Australia is very much committed to you know making sure that we do have representatives who are um, arguably expert but definitely independent and so um, that's why I feel really interested in in getting people's advice and ideas so that um, I can contribute hopefully in 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 some small way that makes a difference but um yeah, there's a lot of work to do. Um, yeah. And I just think I, I like the fact, Magda, that you, you know, we're talking about being kinder to each other. So we don't have to do it all by tomorrow. Yeah. Well, I think that's the message we should all be saying every day to ourselves. First, be kind to ourselves and then be kind to the people around because you can do it all, but you can only do it all if there's a, a generosity of spirit around Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Well, um, politics have... is not always kind, Mina. So you, you've just. You take care, and I know that my advice is probably the same advice you'd give to other people, and that is 
support networks. You can't do it alone. You've got to have honest networks, be they like-minded politically, whether they are women's movement or other, you've just got to have support networks because it can be a brutal profession. I know that applies to other organisations and jobs and roles and professions, but politics is, is a, still a tough game for women. I'm very lucky. My, my biggest support network is the NGO that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. It's the Association of Women to Support Living, uh, who does great international work. And um, although I'm now in politics and I, I've had to take a step back from there, that's my that's my home initially. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and even walking into the organisation um, and feeling that sisterhood, as you mentioned, the, mm -hmm. feeling the serotonin is enough to <laughs> reboot the hard drive. But I think we've That's all felt, wonderful. and let me take it right. I think we, in the recent years, there've been a development of regional networks of women mediators, peace builders, mm -hmm. and I think that has been. And I'm part of two or three. I think that has been such an empowering feeling because you know you're not alone, and you might mm -hmm. not be. It's not. She doesn't have to be in Cyprus. She can be in Australia or mm -hmm. Iceland. But you know, you have like-minded kindred spirits around you that can either support you, offer you. Um, resources or give you a whack when you need to remember to be kind to yourself so i think the sisterhood in every form it's available is really really what keeps us all going because all of us all of us wake up in the morning and can't do anything else but fight for equality mm -hmm. it's as simple as that <laughs> can't do anything different or else we're not alive yeah, and yeah. Ladies, do you have anything else you would like to say before we close because i think we quick point on, absolutely um, just uh, when, when uh, natasha asked what can we do watch out for countries where um rights uh, regarding women's rights are being uh, pulled back so for example turkey uh, withdrawing from the istanbul protocol mm -hmm. um it yes kind of it leaves the cdao hanging hanging and i, I know that um for the turkish cypriot community in the northern part of cyprus mm -hmm. uh we although we have whatever it means for the turkish cypriot community to ratify something we have ratified the cdao and the istanbul protocol but um so we've made it part of our internal law but we can see the infiltration from the turkish uh approach to withdraw from the Istanbul protocol we can see that infiltrating in every aspect of our society of course so um when uh, when um, looking at international networks like women against violence in Europe just take a look at uh, the representation in those networks of um, of uh, organizations that, that come from countries where rights seem to be directly attacked and are regressing mm -hmm. and, and, and give them more of a, a shoulder because life for those organizations are so much uh, tougher. Thank you for that and absolutely um, the um, withdrawal from the uh, Istanbul Convention was a retrograde step yeah. when it came to uh, acknowledging and supporting and advancing rights of uh, of women and girls particularly in relation to violence so mm -hmm. uh, and CEDAW is very aware of that and certainly individual members feel very strongly about it I certainly do. Um, because we're approaching the time, Natasha, is there anything you would like to say before we close this conversation, even though I see a follow up over dinner conversation coming up? But <laughs> for this conversation. No, my, my message is a simple one. All power to you. I think uh, we have many things in common. And obviously, we've got different circumstances in our communities, our countries. But I also think that when no one country has achieved gender equality, we know we've all got to work together to achieve progress and change. So good luck in what you do. You're all role models and you've all just extraordinary, been very generous to me tonight, uh, tonight my time. Um, but in actual fact, I'm very conscious of the, you know, the role model um, and leading work that you're all doing in this sector. So thank you for taking time to talk with me. Um, and one day it might be in person. Let's see. Wonderful. Know. Thank you so much. Is there anything you would like to add? To oh, that? it's been a true honor. Um, I'm, you know, I'm really touched with some of the pieces that have come out and narratives, and I'm hoping that we will all meet again in person. Um, and of course, I have to be honest, I'm inspired by the women in this room and the women outside and outside. Um, and I, you know, thank you for the Australian High Commission for putting this together. It has been really, truly a fantastic morning and it's given me the energy to get back, <laughs> back to the, my office and keep moving. Thank you. Women together are power and uh, it's a wonderful start to the day to, to feel this power. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, it's great to feel the sisterhood, uh, trans-Atlantic. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 It's wonderful. And, thank you. 
and from me, thank you for honoring us with your presence today. Really, a lot of gems came out. I want to also thank my two cherished friends, Mine and Sophia. And I agree, hey. sisterhood, wherever it is, it's so, so important. And with sisterhood, we can actually do anything, or at least wake up in the morning believing we can. Here, here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thanks for the for their work. Now Bye. let's Bye. all change the world. Bye. Together, we'll change the world. <laughs>